Hey, welcome back to First Church of God. Thanks for joining us again this Sunday. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey, I have a friend that was raised in Cushing, and uh, after he graduated high school, he moved away and uh, never really came back. But a uh, good guy, a uh, very creative guy, a lot of fun to be around. And when he was growing up, sometimes his mom would go to the store and buy a candy bar, bring it home, and tell him and his sister they had to split it. So to split it, what they would do is one person was chosen or got to say, I'm going to cut it in half. And then whoever, uh, the non-cutter got to say which side that they wanted. Uh, and it, it, I mean, it's got to be fair, got to be fair. So they would take the time to measure carefully and he'd let his sister have the knife and she'd cut it in half. And he'd pick up both pieces to see which one is a little bit longer. And then he would stick out his tongue and lick both pieces and ask her, which one do you want? Oh, gross. That's not fair. That's not fair. And so often things are not fair. And we get mad. If you have a sibling, you might feel like your sibling um, got away with more than you did, or your parents liked your sibling more than they liked you. My brother and I, we had the same parents, but mine were stricter than his. And I know he's going to disagree with that, and he's going to say it's unfair. They were stricter with me, but the truth is, I know my side of the story. And it doesn't seem like everything is always fair. It wasn't that many years ago, uh, my brother and I, we had a meeting with my mom and dad and we had to go visit their attorney so we could go over the family uh, trust and get the family estate, make sure everything was in order because my mom and dad were getting up in years at that time. And the first thing the attorney said to us was, we always pick the least favorite child to be the executor of the estate. Kevin, you're the executor. Oh, great. Now I know I am the least favorite child, which means they like my brother better than me. But that's okay. I know they really love us both equally, and they always have, and they've always done good for us. I was blessed with two awesome parents. I mean it. Very, very blessed, and my brother was blessed too, even though they were stricter with me than him. But that's another story. We'll talk about that another time. Hey, uh, have you ever heard this term? It's more of a phrase from the South. And this, they, they'll, they'll say this to people. They say, well, bless their heart. Now, now that set phrase has another similar. And it says, well, bless your heart. And the difference between those two phrases is their actual meaning. It's actually uh, the uh, pronoun that is used in that sentence. Well, bless their heart, usually you're talking about somebody else. And when you say, well, bless their heart, really what you're saying is they're an idiot. I'm not going to say it to their face, but they're an idiot. They're not too bright. They're not too smart. They're kind of foolish sometimes. But if they come up to you and say, well, bless your heart, that's a different story. It's meaning I care about you. I'm very thankful for what you've done. You've done something very kind for me. So I just want to express my thankfulness and my gratitude to you. So bless your heart. See, there's a big difference in those two. But there are some people that when you say, well, bless your heart, their heart probably needs it because what's in their heart has been kind of ugly, if you ask me. Uh, we, we, we have people that we've met, or maybe it's even been that person that we see when we look in the mirror getting our hair ready in the morning. And something they say or something you say, something comes out of our mouth and we go, where did that come from? Well, we know because we've been talking about it for the last few weeks. It comes from your heart. And it was Jesus who says in Matthew chapter 15, verses 18 and 19, the words you speak come from the heart. That's what defiles you. For from the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, and sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. And then the wisest man who ever walked the earth other than Jesus, his name was Solomon. And Solomon was given a choice of what do you want to ask me for? Anything you ask, I will make it happen. And Solomon said, I want to have an understanding heart. Well, Solomon wrote these words in Proverbs 4.23 when he said, um, Guard your heart above all else. For it is the wellspring, or it determines the course of your life. It is the wellspring of life. And then we also read something, and this kind of confuses me a little bit, because Jeremiah says, Jeremiah uh, 17, verse 9, he says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond a cure. Who can understand it? 
And if it stopped right there, it'd be kind of desperate and kind of take away any hope that we have. And the good news is it doesn't stop there. It says in verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. You can work really hard to monitor your mouth, to monitor your actions, to monitor your attitudes, monitor your life. But when something comes out of nowhere, something that kind of surprises us and those around us, we wonder where did it come from? And the Bible is very clear. It comes from the heart. It came from within. There are four conditions of our heart that, that sour our attitudes, uh, hurting relationships, uh, 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 some regretful actions, there's guilt, there's anger, there's greed, and there's jealousy. And all of them can be associated with the concept of a debt. So guilt says, I owe you. And we talked about that last week. Guilt says, I owe you. And, and how do we pay that back? Or how do we get out of that? We ask the person that we hurt to forgive us to cancel the debt. Anger says, you owe me. And greed says, I owe me. And jealousy says, God owes me. Jealousy is very dangerous. It's a very dangerous thing because it shapes our attitudes towards others. And it is nearly impossible to love someone you're jealous of. It's, it's hard to serve and help someone that reminds you of what you do not have or, or what you're not. And when things do, uh, go well for someone else, uh, we, we sit and we say, oh, that's not fair. That's not fair. They don't deserve it. I, I deserve it. I do as much as they do. And why can't I have what they have? Well, friends, that is a condition of the heart. And if it's ignored, it's going to turn into resentment. And it's going to turn into bitterness. And resentment demands justification. Jealousy has the power to sour our attitudes towards all groups of people. Wealthy people, supermodels, bodybuilders and everybody else. So the question comes down to this, who are you jealous of? Uh, the, uh, those whose kids seem to um, not be in trouble. <laughs> uh, those whose kids seem to get good grades. Those, who, uh, those people who have a nice car, a better job, more money. And if you look carefully, you're going to see your resentment isn't just covering up your jealousy. You go a little bit deeper and, and you see... Um, what it is, is I'm not getting what I want. And when things go bad for those people that we're jealous of, there's a little bit of a celebration within us. And we get a little bit happy because things aren't going so well for them. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus gives these three different parables. There's the parable of the lost sheep, great parable. Parable of lost coin, great parable. Then there's the parable of the prodigal son, which is one of my favorites. And it doesn't matter how many times I've read that. I always see something new that I've never seen before, such as today. Uh, and uh, in the story, we have the, these two brothers and the younger one goes to their dad and then says, dad, I want my share of the inheritance. And he gets it. And basically he's saying, dad, I want you dead. But he, he's kind of a brat, and he gets his inheritance, and he goes off, and the Bible says he goes into wild living. Eventually, famine comes along in the story, and there's nothing to eat. And the young man finds himself uh, feeding pigs, and he longs to eat what the pigs are eating, which that would have been gross. Not just that they're eating slop, but eating with the pigs, and it's just kind of gross tasting. And in everybody's minds, that is the worst place to be because pigs were considered unclean. And finally, because no one, the Bible says this is a great verse, no one will give him anything. He comes to his senses and he says, I'd be better off going back and being a servant, working for my dad, doing any kind of job other than slopping pigs. And he gets up and he goes on his way. And when on his way back, all of a sudden his dad sees him and his dad comes running to him, which no Jewish dad would have ever done, run to him. That would have been undignified. And, and the father had every right to say, just keep on walking. Don't even come here. But that's not what this father does. The father hugs him. The, the son has just come from the pigsty. He has not taken a shower. He's not put on deodorant. He's still got dirty clothes on. And his father hugs him. His father takes the stench of the pigsty on himself. Isn't that what God the Father did for us? And then he says, put my robe on him, put my ring on him. We're going to have a party 
because my son who was dead is now alive. The boy doesn't even get a chance to take a shower and the dad is throwing a party. And isn't that what God the Father does when we come to our senses and come back to him? But this is what I think we need to see in this story today. And if you look in Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 25, we read these words. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what is going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has, has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, look, all these years, I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, <laughs> have you ever had your kids get, your daughter, your son, they, they, they refer to, it's not my brother or my sister, it's yours. <laughs> no longer my problem, it's your problem. He says, your, your son has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home. You killed a fatted calf for him. My son, the father says, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. And what I believe that we need to see in this is, why, why did the older brother become angry? He said, it's unfair, it's unfair. The older brother wasn't mad at the younger brother. He was mad at his dad. The anger was at his dad. And then comes the accusation because he, he, he's probably been with prostitutes. He's with, been with prostitutes, but there's no proof of it. In fact, the beginning of the story that Jesus says, he says he went into wild living. And the brother is saying, well, dad, you owe me. You owe me. You never did this for me. So the brother um, is absent-minded of the father's position. The older forgot the father's position. It was the, the father's position, the father's prerogative to give as he chose. It, it was his to give. And jealousy, it's misplaced anger. Jealousy says, God, you owe me. When you're jealous of what others have, you're saying, God, why can't I have what they have? Why, why, why do they have better than I do? Which God the Father has the authority to say, how have you been faithful with, with what I've already given you? Uh, why are you being foolish and comparing what you have to what somebody else has? Jealousy caused the older brother to miss seeing the bigger picture. His heart was affected. Uh, his heart was affecting his eyesight. If you see someone with a bigger house or a nicer car, rather than being jealous, maybe you should be thankful because a bigger house means there's a lot more space to clean. A bigger car means bigger payments and, and more higher maintenance. Um, more insurance. I have friends that have a lot bigger churches that they serve, and I am reminded of something that was told to me a long time ago. The bigger the dog, the more fleas. I've learned to be content. And the Bible tells us in Romans 12, 21, do, you, do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. So how do we overcome jealousy? How do we rid our heart of this condition? It starts by taking a long look in the mirror and not across the room. The good news is God understands our frustrations. He understands how we feel when things seem to be unfair. And he directs us to take these steps. He says in uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. When we're willing to humble ourselves before God and we share our disappointments and our discontentment, we're going to find mercy and we're going to find grace. Mercy is God not treating us as our sins deserve and grace is his not treating us as our sins deserve, plus the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. But this is not all that it says in Hebrews. If we back up one verse to verse 15, uh, it says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to 
uh, unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet he did not sin. So when you bring your wishes and wants, your dreams and your disappointments to God the Father, you're bringing them to one who is already able to sympathize with you. And after you've gone to the Father, and this is really confession on our part, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of all unrighteousness. Well, the next part, it's kind of weird, kind of wonky, a little bit different to do, and that is we celebrate the successes of other people that we are jealous of. So to overcome our anger, we forgive. To overcome greed, we give. To overcome guilt, we confess. To overcome jealousy, we celebrate. To guard our heart, you have to celebrate. Romans 12, 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. To guard your heart, you need to go out of your way to express to them you are so happy for them. And this is going to allow you to conquer that monster that is trying to destroy your relationship with others and your relationship with God. I also believe that there is a big difference between being thankful and having an attitude of gratitude. Thankfulness and gratitude are really two different things. If someone holds a door for you, you're thankful that they did that. Being thankful is a feeling of being great, uh, is, is a feeling. Being grateful is showing appreciation for their actions. So as I've been asking, how long? How long are you going to allow your heart to go unchecked? How much more damage can your heart take? Which son have you been? And remember the father welcomes them both back. The father never stopped loving them. I wonder if the old one ever came to his senses like the younger one did. Who are you really mad at? How is your heart? What has been eating at your heart? And how could you begin to go out of your way to celebrate the wins in someone else's life? Pastor Kevin, and I'm praying for you. May the blessings and favor of God be upon you and have a wonderful day and I encourage you to live out this week, a week of celebrating the good in other people's lives. Blessings.